trust everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving this past week, and every day should be Thanksgiving for us. So um, just thankful to have all of you here. Thank you for, for Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and just thankful for the opportunity we have here to worship with him. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here today. If you're one of our first time visitors with us, we have a visitor's card in the pew in front of you. Ask that you complete that and put an offertory plate when it's passed around later. Um, the flowers up front, those are given today in memory of George and Edna McCotter uh, by their family. So thank you for remembering them. Uh, our Baptist Children's Home special offering, we exceeded our goal for that. And that is much appreciated, so thank you for your giving on that. Also, the Appalachian Coalfields Ministries thanks you for all the coats and gloves and toboggans and scarves that y'all donated for that as well. We also have coming up in December, um, December 6th will be our Wednesday night meal. That's also going to be our mission event. We have a special guest. We're going to have Michael Wicker, which is Miss Wicker's son, come join and share with us through some of his ministries and missions that he served on. So please plan to come and join us on December 6th for the meal and to hear Michael speak to us as well. Um, Operation Christmas Child, I know y'all thought we're done with that. We are from getting the boxes in, but there's still opportunities to serve. If you didn't get a chance to fill a box, they still could use some funds to help pay for shipping because they have to pay to ship that. So if you would like, you can donate to that and you just designate it for Operation Christmas Child. So there's still opportunities to serve. And this year, 959 boxes is what our church did, which is amazing. I think that's our record, right? So good job to everyone there. Um, coming up in December, we got Women on Mission will be December 12th at 4 o'clock in the, mission, or the Fellowship Hall. On Wednesday, December 13th, they've got it labeled as a night for families uh, where Mr. and Ms. Claus will come and join us. And it's for all ages. They will be, uh, from what I understand, sharing some of the Christmas story with us. So please plan to come for that as well. And then, if you will, on the back of your bulletin, there's a whole page of children's ministry um, activities coming up through the month of December. You have children, grandchildren, they're active in there. Please hold on to your bulletin because there's a lot of information, and I'm not going to go through all that with y'all, but it is there. It's very important, and the children's ministry does a wonderful job, so please pay attention to that. Thank y'all very much. Good morning. Hi, with me, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have provided for us. As the Pastor Search Committee reviews potential pastors, we feel your guidance as each, is a, as each of us pray over the resumes. Lord, we, we look for and we depend upon your discernment and our choice for the new pastor for here at Lillington Baptist. And we feel your presence within the meetings as we prayerfully consider each of these resumes. Father, may our congregation remain unified and in prayer for this process as we need the prayers of all involved. And Lord, we are so dependent upon your guidance and we know that we have been turned around within the midst of our process when we thought that we were in charge, the Lord have, Lord, we know that you have had a different idea for us and you turn us around in our tracks and we're thankful for that. And Lord, I just want to take a minute to thank you for, for Rick and Linda Gale as they have just stepped up and they have taken, taken control of, of some of the many things that we need here and they have just been awesome and we're so grateful for their presence. Lord, please be with us as we go our separate way, race today, but also we ask that you will give us patience as we need patience in this guidance that we will seek your will and only your will. And this I pray. Amen. Well, Lord, we join in Paul's prayer for the Ephesians that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people and your incomparably great power 
for us who believe. Open our eyes of faith, Lord, that we would see you in your word, in the beauty of your creation, and in one another. Lord, you are beautiful. Help us to seek your face and listen for your voice above all others. Thank you, Jesus, in whose name we pray. In Isaiah 46, God says, this is a quote from God, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Let's continue to sing our worship to the only God who is worthy. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, we do worship you because truly there is none like you. But God, here in your house this morning, in the beauty that the faithful workers provided with Christmas decorations to remind us of this season of your birth, thank you. Thank you to them. And oh God, we thank you for all of the blessings you give us. And I pray that as we return our tithes and offerings to you, that we will consider those around us who need a blessing also. Lord, help us not to be misers, but to give freely of the gifts that you have given to us. Be with us this day, I pray, and keep us in your presence. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So, everybody have a high calorie Thursday? I had a high calorie Thursday, and a leftover high calorie Friday, and then decent calories yesterday, right? I'm just saying, that's the way, that's tis the season, right? Well, it's good, good to be here, and good to be, um, well, it's good to be anywhere, but it's really good for God to do what he's doing, and we're grateful for that. I do want to mention to you a couple of uh, things to pray for, and I'm going to lead us in prayer because we always pray and ask God for the one thing that he wants to speak to us today. Uh, but we want to pray for uh, Glenn Gregory. He's at UNC in the hospital. Um, he's got uh, stage four cancer, and we just need to pray for him, family, all the, the whole nine yards, right? And then um, Alex Dawson is having a procedure this Thursday. We want to pray for him. And I got a word yesterday, a friend of mine, um, that I went to high school with, same age, and all that kind of stuff, died of cancer this past week, the Stedham family. Um, I mean, they all married different people, but uh, that's, that's the family. Um, and so we want to pray, pray for them. Uh, because, as I mentioned to um, some of the deacons, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas is a wonderful season. But there's also a lot of hurt. Uh, why? Because things happen. We remember, and it just can be tough. It just can be. So we want to pray for just, you know, you, you know some folks that I don't know, and so you pray for them. Just lift them up before the Lord for his comfort, his strength. Because uh, for some folks, this is a grueling five weeks of uh, everybody celebrating, and they're kind of celebrating, but not, not, not kind of celebrating. You know what I'm talking about? And so... Let me lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you that uh, we can call you Father, that you know every detail about your children, about the family. Uh, Lord, uh, the, the, the local church, uh, we're the, the body of Christ, Lord. And you said when one member hurts, all the members hurt. And so, Lord, we know that there's uh, some needs, and uh, we do uh, lift up Glenn Gregory and his family, that just uh, you'd uh, give wisdom and uh, instruction comfort and peace to the doctors, to the family, to friends. Same thing with Alex with his procedure. On Thursday, Lord, we were asking you to superintend. Lord, we thank you that uh, you've given um, different medical professionals 
skill, but I pray, Lord, you would enhance their skill. You would increase what they can do and, and what they need to do. And, Lord, we obviously lift up the, the Stedham family and their grief. And, uh, Lord, for uh, others that we each know, Lord, we look to you. And in, this, in these moments, Lord, we want to thank you for your word. And, Lord, there's just a lot we have to be thankful for. And um, we, we say thank you at this season. But, Lord, we thank you that you want to speak to us today. And so we're asking for at least one thing for each of us. Lord, you know what we need. You know our hearts. And maybe it's a word of correction. Maybe it's a word of comfort or counsel. We don't know. But we ask you to speak to us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me just mention, this is my thanks book. Okay? And I've got my, my list here. Each day, there's a person there, then a spiritual blessing, then a physical blessing. And in case you're wondering... Uh, on Thanksgiving Day, uh, I was thankful for two of my grandsons, James and Baby Jack, and then some guys that I uh, meet with um, every other week in discipleship, a guy named Zul and a guy named Ron. And so that's a good Thanksgiving. I mean, a good thing to thank God for, right? And uh, we're grateful for what he is doing and how he's doing that. We'll turn to Genesis 3.15. Um, you know, uh, uh, the season is coming. It's not here yet. I mean, well, it is if you go to the store. They put Christmas stuff out in October, right? But uh, it's coming. And how do I know it's coming? Well, Christmas cards. Well, one of them fell. Oh, no, there it is. Right there. When you see these things coming, you know Christmas is coming, Right? I mean, do y'all get these in June? No, no, no. If you do, you're thinking, oh, he's lost it. She's lost it, right? But they come, and it lets you know, oh, okay. You'll get one, and, and, and sometimes you get one, you go, why are they sending me a Christmas card? Because uh, they hadn't sent one in 14 years. Uh, you know, it, mysteries happen, right? But when you see a Christmas card, uh, you think Christmas is coming. And, and one of the things about Christmas, you know, there's gifts, right? And I thought about this, and so I can just go ahead and say this. I've really got everything I need plus 50 pounds, okay? Um, and I've got a lot of things to be thankful for, as all of us do. I mean, we can, we can talk about that. Uh, you know the song, All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth? Well, I've got a grandson. That'd be appropriate for him. Because he's, and he's always going, Papa Rick, look. And he's shaking it, you know, and then he's pulling it out and, and all this kind of stuff. So he's got several teeth missing, and he does need his two front teeth. But um, maybe you don't have to worry about that. But I want to talk about Christmas cards because I think this is what God sent. Now, they're all in here, okay? And we're going to read the first Christmas card that was ever sent. There it is in Genesis 3, verse 15. Let's look at that. You know the deal. God's created everybody there, but they sinned. And God comes walking in the garden, and where are you? And they're hiding, and then finally, you know, uh, he, he knows where they are. It's not a... They can't hide from him. But he says, um, after they play a little blame game, uh, he says to uh, the serpent, and Adam and Eve are obviously there to hear it. Verse 15, I will put enmity, that means strife, fighting, between you, the serpent, and the woman. It's like, if you want to put it in a blunt way, God declared war at this point. And between your seed and her seed. Huh, seed, that's interesting. He, well, so the seed's a guy. It's a boy. It's a man. He shall bruise your head. And the idea there is crush. Crush your head. In other words, you're toast, snake. That's, that's, the, that's the point of the card. And you shall bruise his heel. 
And the idea of the bruise is not just to, oh, that hurt. It's a bruise that, that kills, the death blow. And so that's, that's the first Christmas card uh, that we have. Well, hundreds, actually thousands of years later, Isaiah writes a Christmas card. And, and you've got it in your bulletin, Isaiah 9, 6. We'll just say it. I'm just going to read it. For a child, that's a baby, will be born to us. A son will be given to us. So that's a child. What kind of child? I don't know. It's a son. Oh, it's a baby boy. Will be given to us. Not just born, but given. Very, very important. And the government will rest on his shoulders. Oh, so he's going to be like a king? Yeah, he's going to be like a king. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom. The word prince is the Hebrew word sar. We got a word czar from it. And Caesar. I just thought you'd, I know that it doesn't matter, but that's what it is. But when you see a Christmas card come, like here we have some Christmas cards, you know Christmas is coming. But God knew Christmas was coming before he created anything. Uh, before creation, before the first person, before the first sin. He already knew. And he prepared for that. And so what can we say about Christmas coming? Number one, God's first promise. We've already read it, Genesis 3.15. The first Christmas card was to Adam and the woman. Okay, so here's, the, here's what's going on. A seed is going to come. It's going to be the seed of a woman. Now, that's very, very strange because the seed technically comes from the man. So what's going on here? Well, about the seed of the woman. God promised a man, he and him. He talks about that there in verse 15. And we see that he's a savior, right? Uh, he promised salvation from sin and evil. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. Um, but in the midst of all this, Adam and the woman hear something. And I want you to look down in verse 20. Okay, it says, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Well, now, wait a minute. When she was created, he named her woman. So now he changes her name. Why does he do that? Well, it's interesting. He says because she's the mother of all living. What's interesting here, um, the the. She's the mother of all living, and it means living. Uh, it's just a Hebrew word that means living. Uh, it's used of people and animals and angels that are alive. But here, it's interesting, it's a Hebrew masculine singular. So we're talking about a guy, an individual, who's going to come. So technically, if you're going to be real technical here, the phrase should be translated, he, the living one. Well, that's that's very significant. Why? I believe that Adam is believing God that he's going to bring the living one, the Savior. Now, does Adam know all, all the everything we know? No. He knows enough. And so he names his wife. In Scripture, in Old Testament especially, when you name someone, it wasn't just a label like, uh, let's name him Jeremy or Andrew, or I like the name, whatever it is that you like, right? It was always either descriptive or prophetic, or both. And here, it's both. It's descriptive, Eve, and prophetic. She's going to be the mother of the living one. Now, guess what? In, in uh, his resurrection, in Revelation 1.18, Jesus appears to John, remember, on the Isle of Patmos? Remember that? You know what he says? Okay, so I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. I am the living one. I mean, he tells us his name. That's one of his names, living one. Huh, what about that? And so the promise to Eve is there's going to be a living one born. Adam believes that, and I believe that Eve believes that. So much so that he changes her name and she receives the name. It's a, to me, it's a profession of faith at that point. 
and that's very, very important. So the card wasn't just about, oh, that's nice. It was about a whole change of life, change of heart, and they realized it. Now, one other thing here, we got to talk about it, about the seed of a serpent. What, what are we talking about there? Well, God acknowledged that the serpent was evil. There's an evil serpent that needs its head crushed. So God's not, he's not uh, ignoring this situation. Uh, he acknowledged the serpent, and he acknowledged the serpent would have a seed too. And that seed would be people with an evil nature and against God and against God's nature, uh, and that, that he would keep working. How do you mean working? Well, he'd keep lying and murdering. Let me ask you this. Has anyone ever lied to you? Have you ever lied? I'm just saying. We all have, and we all have been lied to. We don't like it, right? It's not right. It doesn't fit. Now, Jesus never lied, ever. Never will, never has. It's just not, it's not happening. But the, the enemy does. He continues to lie, and he continues to suggest that you lie. Well, just, just make it a white lie. Just stretch the truth. Well, that's a lie. Um, but God acknowledged here that the serpent, uh, the seed of the serpent, would be against the seed of the woman. It's interesting, in Jesus' day, let me just mention this to you. When John the Baptist, you know, the Pharisees and some others come down to the River Jordan, and he says, what does he say? You brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. What does he mean? Well, he meant they had the nature of a snake and the bite of a snake. And by the way, who was it that put Jesus on the cross? Huh? Yeah, it was the brood of vipers. The snake bites, and it, it meant a death blow to Jesus. But God also acknowledges a crushing blow to the serpent, uh, the head of the serpent, death forever. And uh, he, God is playing that out. So that's the first Christmas card. Now, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Another Christmas card, okay? Never thought about this as a Christmas card. Well, think about it as a Christmas card. Chapter 12, verse 1, Abram is 75 years old. The Lord said to Abram, had said to Abram, he's already told him this, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house. There in Haran, his father, uh, Terah, had died. Uh, get away from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Now get this. I want you to see something about God here. He doesn't say, go to, and he names the place. He says, just leave. I'll show you where to go. Can you imagine? Where are we going? Uh, I'll show you later. Just get in the car. What? What do you mean? Are we going to a cold place, a hot place? Just get in the car. And that's what God's basically saying to Abraham. And so he does that, a blessing uh, there. He says, I will make you a great nation. Now, that's quite the promise because he and uh, Sarai have zero children. I will bless you. Make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Pretty nice Christmas card, right? I mean, it's kind of like, can you imagine getting a Christmas card that says, by the way, you'll be getting a check for a billion dollars next week. I mean, that'd be kind of nice, right? Maybe. If you did, let me tell you this. I'll go ahead and tell you this. If you get a check for a billion dollars, all of a sudden you'll have lots of friends. Okay? Um, so God tells him something here. It's a Christmas card. Now, God amplifies this several years later. How many years later? Well, at least 35 years later, uh, if, if Isaac is 10 years old. But if he's 33, like some people say, it's 58 years later. But it's a lot of years, okay? Look at Genesis chapter 22. They're on Mount Moriah, which is Jerusalem. And Abraham has obeyed God. And they've sacrificed the ram. And God says something to him. And I'm just going to call it God's second Christmas card to, to Abraham. In verse 18, he says, in your seed, we've read that before, right? Genesis 3.15. This is the word, it's 
Hebrew, masculine, singular. It's not talking about a bunch of kids. It's talking about one guy, one man. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, he didn't he say that in Genesis 12? You, all the nations will be earth be blessed? Yeah, yeah. Because you've obeyed my voice. So, what's interesting here, you say, well, you're making that up. Well, I'm not making it up. Because in Galatians 3, Paul said this. He said, uh, who the seed is. And he says, it's to Abraham. And he says, to your seed, that is Christ. It's not like, I wonder who it is. He tells us right there. And so, great Christmas card, right? Now, another Christmas card. This time, to David. Now, this is going to stretch your ability. Turn to 2 Samuel. It's still in the Old Testament, all right? 2 Samuel. Uh, it's after uh, some other books. <laughs> okay. 2 Samuel. David is the king. David is probably... Uh, in his 60s, uh, and God told Nathan the prophet, I, I, I got a word for David, tell him this. And so David goes in and sits before the Lord, um, and there God gives him a Christmas card, if you will. He tells him all kind of things, but in verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, David, you're going to die. I will set up your seed huh, after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He said, well, that's Solomon. Well, there's something interesting here because God says something again. Look at verse 16. Your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before your throne shall be established forever. Now, Solomon's throne didn't last forever. It lasted, I don't know, 40 years. But whoever this seed is, his throne's going to last forever. So David's got this here. And by the way, when he says your seed, it's Hebrew, masculine, singular. It's a guy. It's one individual he is going to be the king. Uh, he's going to be a descendant of David. And God's going to establish his throne forever. So, Another Christmas card, right? I mean, I love to get Christmas cards like this one here. Uh, says God's love still shines bright. It's got the manger scene. Isn't that nice? Isn't that a nice card? Yeah, that's pretty good. And uh, uh, this guy wrote, uh, may your days be merry and bright. Blessings for 2023. So we got this last year. That's, that's good. You know, he didn't have any money in it or nothing. I mean, come on. Put at least a 20 in there, right? So. But that's, that's part of the thing here. But God's giving Adam and Eve and Abraham and David Christmas cards that are, well, you can't even put the value on them. So God's not finished. He's got a list of people on the Christmas card list. So I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1. Now, we're not going to go into great detail on all this. We're just going to read a couple of things. And um, that's in the New Testament. It is after Mark. All right. And in Luke chapter one, Mary is minding her own business in Nazareth. And all of a sudden, here's the angel Gabriel. OK, so that's, you know, angels always I've said this before. Angels always say, don't be afraid. You know why they say that? Because you're scared spitless when an angel shows up. And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. OK, so the angel Appears says, Mary, wow, you are favored. And she's wondering, she's perplexed, she doesn't know what's going on. And then the angel reads the Christmas card. And what does he say? Uh, Behold, and, and that word means get it. Uh, don't miss this. Uh, here it is. Are you listening? That kind of thing. You will conceive. Well, now that's sounding like seed talk. In your womb. Some more seed talk. Uh, could this be the seed of a woman? Hmm, could be. And bear a son, a he, a him. And you shall name him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Huh, that seems to match what God's already said in the Old Testament, that he's going to send a son, a boy, a child, and here it is coming to Mary. Um, and the Lord will give him up, listen to this, the throne of his father David. Well, I'll be. That doesn't exactly match what he what God told David. Um, and he says, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. Well, doesn't that, that's exactly what he said to David. But he says it to Mary. It's a Christmas card to her. There's a lot more there, obviously, but we're not going to deal with all of that. Why? There's one more Christmas card I want to mention to you. It's God's Christmas card to you and me and anybody who's willing to let it come to their mailbox. All right? And what I mean by mailbox, I mean their heart. We're willing to listen to it. What is it? Well, Paul wrote this one, led by the Holy Spirit, whoever will call on the name of the Lord. Be saved, delivered, forgiven, given a new heart, a new life, a new home, eternity with the Lord forever. So, not only is Christmas coming, but Christmas can be with you and me every day. Why? Because whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's in Romans chapter 12. I mean chapter 10, excuse me. Um, and it's a quote from Joel 2.32. It's not like he only said it once. He said it more than once. He said it twice. Roman, uh, Joel 2.32 and Romans 10.13. So you get this Christmas card coming to them. So what does it mean? What, is, what does it mean? Well, what, what, what have we talked about over and over and over again? What is Christmas all about? Is it about poinsettias? I love poinsettias. We've got some poinsettias at our house. I love the greenery. I love the manger scene. I love the stories. I love presents. I love uh, cinnamon rolls. and All those kind of good things that we have around Christmas. Uh, Linda Gale made some... Uh, what do you call those things with the peanuts and the butterscotch and the dark chocolate? What do you call them? Peanut doodles or something? Anyway, they're so good. And they're nutritious because they have peanuts in them. So you're actually eating health food. And dark chocolate's supposed to be good for you. So I'm just saying, I'm just trying to help you here. I think I'm going to go have some health food. And you go in the kitchen and pull out some health food, right? Because God wants us to prosper his way. Does that mean all of us become billionaires? No, that's not prospering his way. Prospering his way is inside where you can have actual joy. Well, how does that happen? Well, you know the ABCs, remember? A, all have come short of the glory of God. Let me just mention this to you. Uh, we'll talk about it next week probably a little bit you know when the shepherds were out in the field and it says the glory of the Lord shone around them you know the last time there was any talk of any glory 600 years before when the glory departed from the temple and it's never mentioned again until Luke chapter 1 so the glory returned wow wow I mean, this is like, whoa, stunning, right? So we're short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve had the glory of God when they were first created. They, it says they were clothed with glory and majesty. And then they sinned. And I think, pfft, I mean, the light went out. So we're short of the glory of God. We don't match up to Jesus' character. We just don't. Unless he fills us and controls us and works in us and through us. So we're all short of the glory of God. All of us are short of the glory of God. No, nobody comes up to par. God doesn't grade on a curve. He grades on the cross. And so he, he knows we're all short. And so that's what he does. 
We all need to come to him and we all need to call on him. So it's all. This is not one of those things where only a few people have to do this. It's all of us. B, believe. Believe what? Well, you believe lots of things. Uh, some of you believe in Santa Claus. Right? Well, maybe not. I don't know. But what we need to believe is that Jesus really did come. I mean, just like the Christmas card says, he really did come, and he really did live, and he never did sin. He was tempted, but he didn't sin. He didn't, he didn't take the bait, ever. And so we believe that, and that he died, he was bitten by the serpent, if you will, by evil, by sin, and he died in our place, buried and it's interesting to me, um, when Joseph of Arimathea came, he said to Pilate, which was, this was huge, could, could I get the body? Because normally they would take criminals, they didn't bury them, they just threw them in the garbage pit, garbage dump, let them burn or whatever, let the animals take care of them. He said, uh, Pilate said, uh, is he dead already? You see, people, when they were crucified in that day, they might last two or three days on the cross. But Jesus was already dead. Six hours, boom, it's gone. And so what did he do? He asked the centurion. The centurion, they always had a centurion at a crucifixion overseeing things. He was in charge of things because they had four Roman soldiers over each criminal. So there would be twelve, at least 12 Roman soldiers and the centurion there at the cross. And he asked the centurion, is he dead? Now, this centurion had seen lots of people die, okay? So it's not like this is his first rodeo. He knows whether or not he was dead. He says, yeah, yeah, he's, he's dead. It's a, cert it's a certified thing right there. And Pilate says, okay. And so Joseph gets Jesus' body, wraps it in linen. He and Nicodemus put uh, lots of oils and perfumes and all that kind of stuff, and he puts it in puts the body in the carved out tomb. Uh, so we, we believe that Jesus lived and he died and he was buried, but he rose again. He didn't stay dead on the third day. He's, he's out of there. You know, they rolled the stone, you know, it was gone. You know why the stone was not there? It wasn't so Jesus could get out. It's so people could get in and see that he's not there. Because Jesus still having trouble. He did he never had trouble with doors or walls or I mean, he just I don't know how I don't know how he did it. It's not magic, it's God. Okay? And he comes out and he's resurrected and they don't believe it. And what's he saying to us? Believe it. Believe that he really lived, he really died, he really paid for our sin. And he rose again. Because he told the disciples, he says, Okay, I want you guys to go and tell everybody about forgiveness that's his point and when people then a b c come and call guess what happens he comes in and he gives new life and he forgives and there's peace you know colossians 1 paul's writing to the colossians he's never met the colossians he's heard about them he knows a lot of them have come to faith in christ and he says to them, oh, by the way, Christ in you, the hope of glory, confident expectation of glory. Because, I mean, you know, look, in, look at our bodies now, right? We don't look so glorious. We really have to work, you know. How many of you want to come next week and bring a picture of how you look when you get up? Oh, look, this is how I look this morning when I got, nobody will do that. Why? Well, I, no, no, we don't want to do that. We want the best of the best pictures. And if you're, you know, I remember, I don't know if it's still popular or not, a few years ago, glamour shots. Y'all remember those? You go to a studio and they do a glamour shot and you're going, who is that? You know. But they do a glamour shot. What does that mean? They touch up the photo. I don't know. But you're going, that they don't look like that. No. God does something, and we don't look like that now. 
but it's from the inside out. C.S. Lewis wrote uh, uh, in uh, his uh, essay called The Weight of Glory, if you could see a saint after they're glorified walking down the street, you would be tempted to fall down and worship them because of their beauty and the aura of magnificence about them. That's what he's, that's the weight of glory that he's talking about. That's what the ABCs of Scripture are all about. We've all come short of the glory of God. Jesus, who came, is the glory of God and died for us, what? To come back to the glory of God. The beauty, the magnificence, the strength, all of that, all of that involves when we call on him. And that's the Christmas card here. Whoever... By the way, it doesn't say whoever's got money, whoever's got education, whoever's got position, whoever's got whatever. It says whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, delivered. Delivered what? Delivered from their sin, from their lack of glory, from their blech. And God, this, this, this Christmas card, you know, you've got three up here. But God sent one to Adam and Eve, he sent one to Abram and Sarai, Abraham and Sarah, a couple of three of them got, you know, they, they, they got it. Even though they laughed when he said, you're going to have a boy. He said, no way, Ray. And she laughed and Abraham laughed. And I said, I heard you laugh. I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. Matter of fact, I think you ought to call your boy laughter. That's what Isaac means. It means laughter. So you're reminded of it every day. Day. Isaac, come in. Time to go to bed. And you're thinking, I laughed. So, but God gets the last laugh, right? And to David, and to Mary, and to us. So, next time you get a Christmas card, if you get one in the mail this week, remember the more important one is the one that God is sending through His Word, by His Spirit. And you don't have to pay postage on it. It's already been paid for. Right? I love to get those things. Somebody says, uh, we'll send you that UPS. All you got to do is put the label on. It's already taken care of. Really? Okay. That's a good thing. So you go to the UPS place and give it to them. They said, okay, you're taken care of. I said, that's it. That's it. Not a penny out of my pocket. Oh, this is good. This is real good. That's what God says. Trust me in this, and God will fulfill his promises. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your promises. Thank you that Christmas is coming, has come, you came, and that um, you really do save, and you keep on saving, and we can trust you for that forever. Lord, I, I don't know every heart here. You do. We've asked you to speak whatever is needed for each heart. So, Lord, I ask you just to remind each heart. I don't know, someone may be really, really, really um, worried, nervous, frantic about something, and you're just wanting to bring a, a moment of peace. Trust me in this. And so, Lord, we, we look to you for that, just as we have prayed for others who have uh, intense needs. We know that. But, Lord, we thank you that you are the God who makes promises and fulfills promises. And we, we bless you for that. We thank you for that. Lord, we give you this moment of invitation for people to let you search the heart and, and comfort the heart and deal with the heart in whatever way we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.